Reports coming to you live from downtown Portland outside the Justice Center where we're getting ready for a protest put on by lawyers. Um, there's some that I've worked with that have been really good and definitely interested to see what's going to be coming from uh, some of these people. Uh, it looks like definitely complaints about, you know, in support of Black Lives Matter. Uh, Feds going home. A lot of the same things that we're hearing from the protesters at other protests, especially the ones at night. So, yeah, things are still kind of clearing up. Um, we're a few minutes early, but just stay tuned and we'll see what's going on.
Testing, testing, testing. distancing and wear their masks during this event so that it can be safe for anyone who's vulnerable who wanted to attend. Our speakers are probably going to be facing primarily this way so I would encourage some of you who are behind the speakers if you'd like you can come to this side of the park. Welcome everyone. It is so wonderful to see so many lawyers, investigators, paralegals, legal assistants, and others here supporting Portland's protesters and the Black Lives Matter movement. Thank you for being here. We stand here today to say with one voice that the action of federal officers who have been deployed in Portland have blatantly violated the rights of protesters to speak, assemble, and be free from violent and unlawful arrest and seizure. Yeah. We are here to stand for constitutional rights. We are here to give voice to our incarcerated clients at the Multnomah County Detention Center. <laughs> who are choking on tear gas at night because of the tear gas deployed by officers and the fact that they are not free to leave their cells. We are here acknowledging that we stand on stolen land and we recognize the native communities in the region today and offer our respect to their elders and ancestors. We are here to use the privilege inherent in our professional license to amplify the voices of the protesters who have been on the front lines for over 60 days. We are here to demand a safe space for black, indigenous, and people of color who are protesting to end violence and for equality. So I ask for you to start today by joining me in declaring that black lives matter. One, two, three. Black lives matter! Black lives matter! Black lives matter! Black lives matter! Black lives matter. Black. Thank you so much. going to introduce our first speaker, Steve Wax. Steve is the legal director of the Oregon Innocence Project and before that was the federal public defender for the District of Oregon for 31 years. On a personal note, at 19 years old, I decided I wanted to attend law school while working in Steve's office at the federal public defender. I was lucky enough to observe him and his team represent seven Guantanamo Bay detainees with a pureness of heart and endless energy and an excellence of advocacy that was absolutely contagious. I saw people on his team on multiple occasions literally running through the halls of the office desperate to break their clients out of the darkness and desperate as lawyers paid to fight against the federal government to stand up for the rule of law and the rights of our clients and the principles that make our country great. Please welcome Steve Wax. Mask off. <laughs> well, thank you, Jessica, and thank you all for being here today. 
Many of the people here are either lawyers or work in the legal profession. And we're gathered here as members of that profession or people who work in it to give voice to our beliefs that the rule of law and equal justice are the foundation of a free and just society. We're gathered here to give voice to our outrage that George Floyd was callously murdered, callously murdered by men who swore to uphold the law. And we're here to support the Black Lives Movement that has been so energized by that horrible act. We're gathered here because the video of the knee on George Floyd's neck ripped the lid off the fact, the lie, that has lived for too long in this country that police killings of black and brown people are justifiable acts of self-defense. And we're gathered here because Donald Trump has exposed his own racism and lack of respect for our Constitution and the rule of law by sending federal agents to attack the people of this great city and this great land. I've been fortunate, I've dedicated my career to promoting the rule of law, mainly as a defense attorney, but starting out as a prosecutor. And in both capacities, I learned that laws are not enough. Even-handed application of just laws is a necessity if a society is to be truly free. And so too is an understanding that our leaders in Washington sorely lack that power and force are not the same as law. Following the police killings, the pandemic, and the protests that have roiled our nation this year, I saw a cause for some hope as the Supreme Court wound up its term. The Oklahoma decision regarding the sovereignty of the tribes there and the backing of the prosecutor's subpoena for Trump's financial records. In doing that, the court reminded us all that no one is above the law. But recent events have dimmed my hope, reminding me of my work that Jessica just mentioned with the detainees in Guantanamo. For while the rule of law lives in this great land, it is fragile and it is under attack. And the use of force by police, brought into high relief by the killing of George Floyd, is continuing to test our country's commitment to the rule of law, to test it here in Portland, as demonstrated by the actions of the Portland police and their response to the protests here before the feds were called in. The arrival of the federal agents followed the dictator's playbook that we saw when Trump called out federal agents to break up peaceful, legitimate protesters across the street from the White House so he could have a political photo op. That's the political playbook of dictators, not the leader of a democracy. The federal agents who are here are acting as if they were an occupying army and applying tactics that are more in line with what we saw years ago from the KGB and what we see today from the FSB in Russia and other dictatorships around the world. Now I never thought I would see such tactics here in our city. Oregonians have been shot by so-called non-lethal munitions, whatever that means, sustaining serious injuries. Other people have been seized, driven around, brought into that building, questioned, harassed, intimidated, and then just let go. Those tactics are intended to subjugate. They are intended to intimidate. They trample on the Constitution. They're all too familiar 
in black and brown and other minority communities. We see them in this primarily white city. But we must not forget the long and sordid history of racism and racial violence throughout this land. And these tactics must stop. The president, and it pains me to use that honorific, has directed federal law enforcement officers to protect federal property and given them weapons to do so. But let's be clear, the president's word does not give them free reign under the rule of law. And while dealing with protesters is emotional and difficult for law enforcement, that does not excuse or justify violence, the violence we have seen here against protesters. And while our elected officials have condemned the actions, at least the congressional people, and the mayor who showed up one night, the head of the police force who has not stopped the police force, the statements of our congressional delegation are laudable, but they're not enough. There is much more that needs to be done. There have been numerous civil actions filed, some by people who are here today. Those need our support. Civil actions are terrific. Injunctions, and there have been a couple of injunctions from the federal judges here recently, may not have been followed yet, but at least they have spoken. But those two are not enough. There is more to be done. We must invoke the criminal law. The Multnomah County District Attorney and the United States Attorney must convene grand juries and inquire into the legality of the actions of the federal and state police. Now I think the new DA, or soon to be DA, Mike Schmidt, said he was gonna be here, I think he is here, and if so, Mike, this is for you. <laughs> Your predecessor has said with the Attorney General that they're opening an investigation. I implore you, carry it through with a grand jury, with subpoena power, because as you and all the lawyers here know, shooting a person in the head with a supposed non-lethal weapon of some sort, as depicted in the video, may well be a crime. It may be attempted murder. It may be assault. It and it may be part of a conspiracy, depending on who in Washington said what and gave what direction. And if there's going to be a grand jury investigation, my thought is, it should not focus solely on the people here standing in front of the courthouse wearing the camo uniforms. It needs to find out who gave the orders. And they need to be part of a prosecution. As with the law enforcement officers who killed Mr. Floyd, Nothing in the law immunizes federal agents in Portland from criminal prosecution. If crimes have been committed, committed the rule of law can only be vindicated. And we can all be kept safe only if indictments are sought. I urge everyone here, a lawyer, a person who works in the legal profession, to remember we have a voice we have an obligation, we have tools at our disposal under the law to do what we all can to enforce the law to make sure that the rule of law is vindicated. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Thank you. Next up is Ashley Albies, civil rights attorney, National Lawyers Guild attorney,
and one of the lawyers for the Don't Sheet Shoot Portland case that is ongoing. Longtime person, I met Ashley years ago, dealing with the federal government, the NSA, the Mayfield case, and those issues. Ashley, you got a wipe? What's up, everybody? Hello, lawyers. I really appreciate everybody being down here. I think as lawyers, um, it's important that we recognize the role that the rule of law has played in getting us where we are here today. Slavery was legal. Jim Crow was legal. Qualified immunity is currently legal. Measure 11 is currently legal. That is the reason why we have our jails filled with black and brown people disproportionately. Our more for this one. Eskimos are more for this. Eskimos are also important. Thank you. I appreciate that correction. So thank you for saying that. As lawyers, we need to not just look to the legal system. 4.1 million. 4.1 million. That's why we need to make sure, sir. I don't want to. I don't want to ignore you at all. But I, I want to get through this speech, and I hope respectfully you let me do that. I appreciate that. Um, we are here to think about the ways that the legal system perpetuates racial inequality in our communities and in our structures and in these systems. And we are asking for you to fight back against these things. It's not just about doing pro bono work, which which is incredibly important. It's not just about filing civil suits or handling discrimination cases. It's where you see discrimination and racism turn up in every facet of our legal community, from the Oregon State Bar, to the Multnomah County Courthouse, to the federal courthouse. We have an obligation to educate ourselves, educate each other, and call it out when we see it, and support people who are standing up and fighting against racism. We have an obligation to understand what mutual aid means, looking at riot ribs over there. Have yeah. folks donated to riot ribs? Have they supported a group of people down here feeding people 24 hours that need food without compensation, without thought of anything but trying to serve people? We have medics down here who are providing uh, medical attention to people who are injured by protests. That's the kind of mutual aid that we see the Black Lives Matter movement supporting, creating, fostering, imagining, and we need to bring that into our legal community. We need to support those efforts. We need to find and carve space for mutual aid, envisioning what a, lot, what a uh, community looks like that is built upon mutual respect and aid for each other. <laughs> I appreciate the call for a um, protest tonight, a wall of lawyers. I think that's really important. There's the wall of mothers, and it's really important to recognize that there is a, the mothers of the movement predated the wall of mothers. And that is a group of mothers who have lost their children to police violence. And mo those mothers have been speaking out against racial injustice and police violence, hey. targeting their black and brown children for many, many years. And we need to elevate those voices, and we need to center the voices of the Black Lives Movement and the message that they're sending, and get on board. When we fight, we can win, and we can do that together. <laughs> Next, I want to introduce one of my favorite humans <laughs> on the planet, um, Nikenge Harmon Johnson, who's the president of the Urban League of Portland. She is a badass lawyer. She's an amazing woman. And please um, give her your attention. Let's make Portland a reservation. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I am Nikenge Harmon Johnson. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Urban League of Portland, but long before that, I became a member of the Oregon State Bar. I am a lawyer, and to me that means something. It means something every single day, although I don't do what many of you do. 
I don't litigate. I don't file appeals on behalf, on behalf of clients. I don't stand in courtrooms. I don't even do will states and a trust, right? I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> what I do though is fight for civil rights every single day. And when are the feds walked off their porch into our streets. I knew then and felt in my gut that it was time to get some, yeah. right? Because when I became a lawyer, I didn't know what I would do next exactly, but I knew it would be a good thing to do. I knew it would be a good thing to know other lawyers. I knew it would be a good thing to understand this little book in my hand called the Constitution from the top to the bottom. I knew that whatever I chose to do with my career, it would be worthwhile for a black woman, a woman who grew up in Salem and Portland, Oregon, who never met a black lawyer until she went to college. A middle class kid who was second generation college, but never met another black, never met a black lawyer until I went to college. I knew it would be a good idea for me to be a lawyer. I didn't know it would be because of this day, but something about our history told me that a sister like me needed to have some tools. Woo! I am honored to stand here with you today, lawyers and investigators and paralegals and those of you who love us, because this is our time and our moment. I wanna tell you a story. Uh, I am a proud graduate of Howard University School of Law where civil rights lawyers are built. And don't get me wrong, we can come from all over, but be clear. I am the proud wife of a civil rights lawyer, Erias Johnson. But right out of law school, I worked in the, United States, in the United States Congress. I worked for a congresswoman from Texas. And I was the new kid in the office as ledge counsel and got, tabbed with, with, uh, got tasked with going to career fair at an elementary school. And I've been to career fairs as a school kid and I thought this would be a cool thing to do. I'm excited, I'm ready to go. And then I figured, uh-oh, what do I bring to give to kids? Right, I'm a lawyer, it's an elementary school, it's career day. There's gonna be firefighters and there's gonna be some farmers. There. There's gonna be people who have animals and like cool stuff and I work in Congress. <laughs> What's my cool stuff? So I got a box of these. Pocket constitution, y'all. These little things right here. I picked up a box and I brought them into third, fourth and fifth graders and it just so happens that my little booth was next to the booth of the FBI. <laughs> And they had all kinds of cool stuff on their table, right? Stuff things, you know, kids could touch and look at and play with. And they came to my table and one little kid asked me, said, well, what do you have? And I picked this up and said, I've got the Constitution. <laughs> well, what's that good for? This is the user's manual for those guys right there. <laughs> right? The FBI's got some tools, but we've got this and they work for us. Let me tell you about it. I knew then what we all know. It matters, but it only matters if we make it matter. Because the occupant of the White House could care less. De never read it, doesn't get it, what's the point? But you've read it, you get it, you know the point, so you've gotta make it matter. If you don't, well, let's see. The world is watching. What does that mean about you in a time like this if you don't make this matter? Native attorneys for BLM, thank you, sis. Lawyer for justice now, right now. Not tomorrow, not next week, right now. Feds go home. I'm reading some of the signs out here, y'all, because you understand what it means. You understand the task before us. We object. We object. And we object right now and loudly, and we have the tools to do it. We took the same oath to protect and defend the First Amendment, did we not? Last week, in the middle of the night, I pulled up the oath that we all took to become members of the Oregon State Bar. I'm gonna encourage you to go back and read it. Maybe post it next to your laptop or your computer. Maybe put it in your wallet and remind yourself that we took an oath to defend not only the Constitution of this state, but that of the United States of America. And while there have been many times, in fact, for all of history, quite frankly, people like me have not been able to have our full access to rights as citizens, 
That does not stop me from standing up in this moment because this country is mine and it will live up to its commitment to me, to you, and to us all through the force of our will, the power of our hands, and the strength of our minds. It will live up to the promise of the American dream, all that that should be and has yet to be, if we make it so. So I stand here today. I stand here today in the name of Mr. John Lewis. I stand here today in the name of Mr. C.T. Vivian. I stand here today in the name of Kendra James, in the name of Breonna Taylor, in the name of George Floyd, and too many others. But I also stand here today in honor of Michael Fesser, a black man in our community who was wronged by law enforcement right here in our community. I stand here alongside Paul Buchanan, Michael Fesser's lawyer, and I want to tell you another quick story about him. Paul Buchanan is, is, wouldn't call himself a civil rights lawyer. Employment is more his thing, and I'm getting to know him a bit right now, but he sort of stumbled into the Michael Fesser matter and the mess of West Lynn, and frankly, the Portland Police Bureau, and the Multnomah County DA, don't forget. And he said, wait, this happens in my community? This happens in my town? This level of injustice is allowed to perpetuate itself in West Lynn, in Portland, in the most progressive city we like to think of ourselves as in the country. This kind of evil, rotten racism exists in our criminal justice system, unchecked, unpunished. And Paul Buchanan decided, not on my watch. He decided to get some. So I implore all of you, with the tools that you have right now, whether you call yourself a retired lawyer, a recovering lawyer, <laughs> someone who maintains her membership to the bar just because it matters that much, whether you're a trial lawyer, an appellate lawyer, a defender or a prosecutor, it matters not. Because you're a lawyer. And the time for you to do what lawyers do is right now right now. Before I bring my friend to the stage, Portland is not a constitution-free zone. That's right. We're special, we're not that special. Protected speech is not probable cause. Feds, go home. Say it with me, feds, go home. We can make them do it. Yeah. Yeah. After they're gone, y'all, we still got work to do. The Portland Police Bureau was already acting like the federales yeah. before the feds arrived. The feds have just helped them amplify the violence. So don't stop, don't quit. If you've arrived because you've seen it's been one step too far, one straw too much, stay in the game and stay in this fight. Because black lives matter and we're in this work we see this violence and this tear gas on the streets, these so-called non-lethal munitions, because the police want to maintain the right to kill black people without consequence, to kill indigenous people without consequence, to kill Latinx folks without consequence. They simply want to be able to do what they want to do without regard to the oath they took to protect lives and people and frankly our constitution. And we can't allow it. So now that you're here, I say welcome and stick around. Black Lives Matter, say it with me. Black Lives Matter. 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 That's right. That's right. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't quit. Don't stop. Get some, y'all. Get some. Uh, Tristan is a lawyer with the, uh, with the Metropolitan Defender, uh, and she's a badass. Thank you so much to all the brilliant speakers.
Three years ago, I moved from New York City to Portland. In doing so, I left an extremely diverse city where I was a part of a very supportive black community to become a public defender in Portland, the white, one of the whitest cities in America. <laughs> Days before I moved, uh, driving down from my, where my parents live in Tacoma to my new home in Portland, a man boarded a MAX train and killed two people and attempted to kill another person in what was understood to be a racially motivated attack. I had extreme hesitations about whether I had made the right choice and about whether Portland was really a safe place for me. And over the last three years, I've learned a lot. I have learned that the Portland Police Bureau routinely brutalizes vulnerable people, disproportionately so to black and brown people. I've learned that a system that is built on dehumanizing, brutalizing, and caging other human beings is not a system that is going to prevent violence. Yes. Violence begets violence. I learned that the man who committed the hateful and violent act that made me fear living in Portland had himself been subjected to years of solitary confinement in prison, an institution, American's main institution for breeding violence, its most successful breeding ground, even though it purports to do exactly the opposite of that. I have also learned that there are hundreds if not thousands of people that live in this city who are willing to subject themselves to the system's violence in order to deliver a simple message. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. On Tuesday night, I followed two young uh, and passionate legal, ass legal assistants from my office uh, down to the protests. I, what I saw uh, was mirrored in much of what I had read in the news um, and heard on OPB. But I was surprised by the incredible emotional impact that it had on me. The first thing I saw was a community of people coming together to support each other. I saw people making food for each other. I saw people standing in support for people who had come to the protest by themselves. I saw individuals handing out helmets uh, and signs, and I saw so many other displays of solidarity. Woo! And then the moms came. Yeah! <laughs> I was floored by how many moms came. And I appreciated their recognition of their privilege and that black moms have been fighting this fight for longer than anyone. Yeah. I know... And now for a shameless plug of my own black mother who is the most hardworking and genuinely passionate person I have ever met. I was also moved by the number of people who showed up to the protest wearing goggles and gas masks and helmets, fully ready to put themselves in harm's way to protect the protesters and their call for abolition of a system of this system and its violence. Yes. As I stood behind the wall of moms, I realized that they were also here to protect me. I realized that for the last three years, I have lived in a city that struggles with racism, that struggles with police brutality, and a system that perpetuates all those things. And that in that city, there are also thousands of people who are so committed to protecting black lives that they would show up on the streets for months even though they knew they were putting themselves in harm way and risking serious injury. I left the protest around 10.30 p.m. without seeing any law enforcement. When I woke up the next morning, I opened my phone and I saw a video of the moms being attacked and shoved and gassed by federal agents wearing military uniforms. 
I saw a post made by one of the friends that I had gone to the protest with showing that she had been hit in the head by a non-lethal bullet. She was not injured, but only because she wore a helmet to protect herself. The people of Portland should not have to wear helmets and gas masks to safely exercise their constitutional rights. PPB should not be brutalizing protesters. PPB should not be deploying tear gas against a federal order and subjecting protesters and the human beings that are caged in the Justice Center to such toxic substances. DHS should not be occupying the streets of downtown Portland to commit the same atrocities. Our mayor should not be so devastatingly late to addressing these critical issues. And a federal paramilitary should not be disappearing people off the streets of Portland. And I mean this in the context of what has happened in the last week to protesters and in the context of what has been happening the last several years for undocumented people in our community. Tonight, Portland attorneys are being invited to join the late night protests and stand up to these federal officers who have invaded our city. I invite you to join me and many of my colleagues in this demonstration if you are able to do so. I recognize that attending this, that the late night protest may not be possible for some of you or maybe even most of you. And so I'm asking you to also make a commitment to donate your time, your expertise, and your money to the cause. We have circulated a list of action items. They're on the different tables that are around the square. I invite you to pick one up if you haven't done so already. Uh, the action items de give, give the details for tonight's protest. Uh, they also uh, provide uh, an opportunity for people in the legal community to volunteer their services for the National Lawyers Guild, uh, which has been out protecting protesters in so many different capacities and can use your help. They need help from the legal community and we are here to give it. There's an email address on the form that allows you to contact uh, the organizers uh, so that we can pass on that information. And the, the action items also include several organizations uh, that are either supporting the protesters uh, or are boots on the ground uh, or are there to support the people who are brutalized by the system. So I encourage you to look over those organizations and consider making a donation. I'm, I'm also asking you to make a commitment with me right now to opposing the current threat to our Constitution and to supporting the movement for black lives. And if you did happen to pick up one of these copies of the Constitution, you can hold it up now. I commit to taking action. I commit to taking action. I commit to protecting the Constitution. I commit to protecting the Constitution. I commit to fighting injustice. I commit to fighting injustice. And I commit to supporting black lives. I commit to supporting black lives. Thank you all so much for being here today. I commit to preventing the courthouse from being burned down. Thank you. Thank you. Can anyone commit to that? Thank you, thank you, brother man. I remember you. Look at it, it's a fortress. It's not gonna burn down. Be quiet. All right. so you will allow us to do so. I'm gonna speak. I won't be silent. You gotta get the federal stormtroopers out of here. I'm worried about a planet on fire.
Are we standing for the rule of law here? We have to submit. We have to submit our police to the rule of law. All right. Well, that concludes our conference. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.